Good morning, everybody. Announcements. We have Bible study and breakfast, 915. They start a new series today on the soul and what happens at death. So they're working on that, I believe, for a few weeks. And the food pantry, yesterday we went out and put flyers out. Uh, we actually had a chance to talk to about three different people, three or four different people. Always happens, always a good thing. And uh, we had six people helping yesterday. Uh, Saturday, we're going to meet here at 9 o'clock and go out to pick the food bags up then. So be here, and uh, we usually pray together, talk together, and pray together, and then go out and uh, get started at 9 o'clock. Prayer time at the church. This month is July 6th and July 20th, and that starts at 6 o'clock. The cookout is today. Now, we have meat and rolls provided, and then everyone should have brought a dessert item or a food item to share. If you didn't, stay anyway. We'll have a lot of food. There's food here. Okay, so don't feel bad. Stay. If you didn't bring anything, we're not worrying about that. Youth group, they have a schedule coming up. And the seventh is water night, and that's 6.30 at the church. And bring your, uh, wear your proper, appropriate swimwear, which is anything that you want to get wet. Now, the God Loves You Tour. Got that right this time. September 25th, 4 o'clock, and that's Franklin Graham, and then it's the Newsboys will be with them to do music. And, Tyrus, you know them guys, don't you? Boy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not personally. I thought, <laughs> I thought you performed with them down in Quarryville there at the... Uh, at the muddy run that time. <laughs> okay. So put that on your calendar. I want you to know tonight that God loves you. Prayer chain is up there, but that's being changed. There's going to be a direct link um, to do that through the computer and everything. Email address. Do you have that email address? Prayer at IEFC. York.org. That's going to be the official way that you either ask for prayer or if you want to be included. But you also have to get on there and contact that through that website to be added to the list. Or that would be the, the best way to get added to the list. But that is not up there at this point. And these were made out two weeks in advance because the person that does this is going on vacation. <laughs> so it's not in here either. The only other thing I have is, Ben, good to see you got the memo on shirts today. Yeah. Get on. <laughs> okay. Are there any other announcements? Uh, please stand for worship. Good morning, everyone. You're right, Brian. The blue polo is a good choice. I totally agree. So. All right. Let's. <laughs> first off, this is Amazing Grace. Let's listen to voices of worship. breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory and the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves 
Jesus breathless in awe and wonder the King of glory the King above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you give down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me. All that you've done for me. Amen. You guys sounded great this morning. Keep it rolling. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show. Jesus, the name above every other name. And Jesus, the name above every other name. And Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. And holy, there no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me I'll build my 
build my life. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Let's sing that again. I will build my life. And I Beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Let's sing that again, holy. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken. Amen. All right, so this next one, maybe a little less familiar to you, but you might have heard it before. It's kind of like a musical liturgy, if you will. Um, the parts in parentheses and the verses those are the responses in the call and response. Um, so it's like, if I'm leading the liturgy, um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question and you'll, the response is right there. It's like two words, so it's not hard. Um, and then, and then if, if it were a liturgy, again, to use that analogy, um, the chorus is like, it's like in bold and it says all in front of it, if you will. And you can sing as much of the song as you want, but definitely kick in on those parts. That'd be fantastic. It's called, Is He Worthy? This theme of worthiness of Christ, as you can see. As I cleverly talk while I tune my guitar to distract you from the fact I'm tuning my guitar. Sort of. Okay, here we go. All right. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We, we do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We, we do. do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? 
of our blessing and honor and glory is he worthy of this he is does the father truly love us he does does the spirit move among us he does and as jesus our messiah holds forever those he loves he does does our god intend to dwell again with us he does is anyone worthy is anyone holy is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, from every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the fact that you've given us the gift of your son. Thank you, Jesus, that, that everything we have sung is true, that um, it echoes the, um, the passage in Revelation of, you know, like who will open the scrolls, who is holy, who is able to do this, and, and Jesus, you are. You are the promise um, yeah, that, that, that came before for us and, and died and rose again, and that you're coming again, and that we can look forward, hopefully, to that. And I thank you for this gathering. Thank you for every person who's here. Um, each one of us is here for a reason. And I pray you guide us throughout the rest of this time through, uh, through music, through, through message, through uh, fellowship and, and communion. And we thank you for loving us. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning. That's better. It is a good morning today. Hallelujah. God's going to fill us our day today with sunshine. He's going to fill our day with good uh, fellowship together after church. And I'm glad for everybody that's here today. I'm glad for you today. Hallelujah. I want you to listen to a song. Like, hold on. Hold on. I'm not done yet. Thank you. It just took me a minute to get this out. Well, uh, last year, me and Gary did this together, and he stood here with the flag, and we sang Battle Hymn of the Republic, and uh, I miss Gary. I miss Louie. I miss all those veterans and stuff that's not here with us today. And This is going out to all the veterans and everybody that uh, served in the, in the fight to bring Jesus into all the world. And I want you to listen to the words of it. Battle Hymn of the Republic.
Don't scare me like that. <laughs> Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword, for his truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Help me sing. hundred circling camps they have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps i could read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps for his truth is marching on help me out church glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah glory Sounded forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He's sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Be swift my soul to answer, be jubilant my feet, for his truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory. With glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free For his truth is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah glory, Amen. Now you can praise the Lord. <laughs> I had to get those final taps in there. No, oh, God is so good to us. Father, we just thank you, Lord, today for the opportunity, dear Jesus, to be in your house, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us, where you brought us from, where we are today, and where you're taking us to, Lord. Surely, Lord, thou knowest, thou has higher heights for us, the church, Lord, and uh, we want to prove our faithful, Lord, and we want to lift up your name, Lord, and glorify you, Lord, because I believe, Lord, the blessings of heaven will fall if we glorify your name. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for being here today. Lord, we invite you into this service today, Lord, and we just ask you to be here, Lord, right now, and Jesus, take over this service Lord, as we go on for you, Lord, I ask you also that you bless the offering. Lord, let it be a witness unto your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brother Taris, it's all yours. Good morning, everyone. 
You know, uh, this probably isn't surprising at all, but I'm a huge fan of musicals. Shocker, right? Never sang with the Newsboys, though. I did not. <laughs> but <laughs> That's true, Ron. Um, but I realize that some people aren't a fan of musicals, really, at all. Um, but if I named a few movies that were musicals, I usually get this response. Oh, well, I like that one. You know, my wife and I sometimes talk. She's like, I don't really like musicals. And I name a bunch of musicals. She's like, oh, I like those. But I, I, figured out, I figured out something, though. The type of musicals my wife doesn't really like and the type of musicals that even I don't really like, the difference between a musical and a telling a normal story is that people just randomly burst out into song. So that's already kind of, you know, puts some people off. Like my dad used to say, why don't they just talk? You know, but what makes the difference between a good musical and a bad one? Well, I typically, a musical number, what makes it a good musical number is that it has one of two things, or maybe even has both. One is that it reveals character or advances the plot forward. The best musical numbers do both at the same time. So case in point, I have confidence in me from The Sound of Music. So we know that um, Maria is told that she's going to go to the Von Trapp family and be their, be their new governess. And she's a little unsure of herself. And she's singing this song about what she feels inside. And the question is, will she rise above this new circumstance or not? How does she feel about that? And the song is revealing all of that while she sings. And it has the illusion that it's moving the plot forward because during the song, she's going towards, she gets closer and closer to their house. So that's a good musical number. Now, of course, it's possible to break this rule. You can have a musical number that doesn't really reveal character or plot, but you have to do something very important if you don't have those elements. It has to be really, really good. <laughs> Case in point, The Lonely Goat Herd. That song in The Sound of Music doesn't advance the plot. It doesn't reveal any character. But we don't care because the song is so good, right? So you can break that rule, but it, it, ha it has to be really, really good. The problem with some musicals is that some are filled with songs that don't fit these criteria. Those musicals are typically boring and not really fun to watch. With that said, I couldn't help but think of that as we approach our text today. Now, please open your Bibles to Genesis 38. Genesis 38. Genesis the first book in your Bible. And also, I will be reading out of the ESV today. We are continuing our sermon series called The Many Colors of Providence. Remember that providence is the means by which God enacts his perfect will in his creation. The means by which God enacts his perfect will in his creation. So far in the series, we have seen that Joseph's life has taken a few twists and turns. Uh, we see that he was his father's favorite child, uh, that his brothers hated him and have also betrayed him. They jumped him, threw him in a pit, and sold him into slavery, and he's headed down to Egypt. And that's where we left off at the end of the last chapter. They have deceived uh, Jacob into thinking that Joseph is dead by covering his coat in goat's blood. And we are so curious. We, we can't wait. So naturally, our curiosity as readers of this account is we're asked, what's going to happen to Joseph? We get to the end of chapter 37 with all of this stuff happening, and then it tells us that Joseph was sold to the captain of the guard of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And we wait with eager expectation. We can't wait to read the next chapter. What's going to happen to Joseph? Genesis 38, verse 1. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. What? 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 I, aren't you thinking the same thing? What about Joseph? Who cares about Judah? Why, why is this here? Why is it there? Also, if you've seen the heading and you're familiar with this account, <clears throat> it's the story of Judah and Tamar. <clears throat> On the list of everyone's favorite Bible stories, this is usually, and I'm pretty confident, 10 out of 10 times never makes the list. In fact, most pastors would skip it, especially if you were telling, if you were trying to reenact the story of Joseph, you would just cut this part out. Why? Because it doesn't seem to advance the plot or reveal anything about the character of Joseph that we want to know. So Tyrus, why are you doing it? Well, I believe that all scripture is God-breathed and profitable and useful for us 
And when we talk about the narrative of Joseph to skip over it, there's a reason the Holy Spirit inspired it to be here. So with all that said, as we go through this very interesting, uncomfortable story, I want you to keep these things in mind. Keep this in mind. I want you to keep in mind God's promise to Abraham. God's promise to Abraham, he made a covenant with Abraham to give him land, to give him seed. Now the word for seed would be offspring, children. And the last one is blessing. Land, seed, blessing. One of the great emphases in Genesis is placed on offspring and descendants. Remember, I've said this before. The story of Joseph is about how God uses the rejected godly brother to save, preserve, and reconcile the covenant family. Judah is a part of the covenant family. And so we're going to focus on Judah's offspring in this particular passage, which is why the first heading will be Judah's offspring. And we're just going to move through the story, and hopefully I'll convince you that this passage of Scripture not only should be here, but is actually helpful and useful to us. First one is Judah's offspring, if you're taking notes. That'll be the first heading. Judah's offspring. We've already read the verse one. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Kazib when she bore him. So what do we get here? Well, Judah left his home. He left his family. Now, we don't really know why the text doesn't tell us, but perhaps it's possible he's feeling a little guilty. Remember what just happened. Judah just jumped his second youngest brother, and it was his idea to sell Joseph into slavery. He just deceived his father and made his father mourn for many days, and he crushed his father's spirit, thinking that his favorite son was dead. It's possible that he just didn't want to be around that anymore. He's like, I got to get out of here. The guilt's too much. So it's possible that that was a motivation for him to leave. But Judah marries a Canaanite woman. We don't get her name in this passage. But in 1 Chronicles 2.3, it says that her name is Bathshua. Bathshua. Now, Judah marrying a Canaanite, the text brings out this. But if we're familiar with the story of Genesis, we know that Abraham and Isaac deeply desired that none of their descendants would marry Canaanites. Why? Because the Canaanites are pagans. They worship a different god and... Who you're married to can affect your spiritual life to a great deal. They don't want their descendants marrying people who don't worship the true God of Yahweh. But nevertheless, Judah gets married, and he has three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. feel bad for Shelah. (laughs) Not the most masculine name there. Nevertheless, that's their names, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. And so those are Judah's offspring. Remember, Genesis is a huge emphasis on offspring, but what's going to happen to them? Offspring is important, but it seems very quickly as we read the text that they're about to be put in jeopardy, which is why the next portion of the text we'll go through, we've looked at Judah's offspring. Let's look at the jeopardy of offspring. Something is going to happen to them. Verse 6, and Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and named, and her, and sorry, her name was Tamar, but Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Now, we're going to stop right here. Ur, it appears that he was really, really bad, really, really wicked, but the Bible doesn't tell us what that wickedness was, but it must have been something really, really bad because God puts him to death. He puts him to death, and next we get this interesting account that Judah tells his second-born son to do something. Now, in our modern context, we really don't understand this that well, but what is happening here is the Bible's first mention of the concept of Leverite marriage. Now, we need to understand Leverite marriage to understand the next part of the text, so I'm going to explain it to you. Understanding Leverite marriage was like this. It was a custom in ancient Israel, which we can find greater details about in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10. Now remember, at this point in the Bible narrative, the law hasn't been given down yet, but nevertheless, this appears to be something that God codified into Israelite law. 
If a man died without sons, his brother would take the widow for a wife in order to provide male offspring for his dead brother. The firstborn son then would be considered the heir of the dead brother and receive his land, possession, and inheritance, thus preserving that deceased brother's family line and his name would live on. This also provided provision for the mother who was left behind by her husband's death. So we learn a couple things. God cares about preserving someone's name and their family line. He cares about that. We also see that he cares about the care for widows, which widows were not, did not do very well in the ancient world. They were considered very lowly. And so this was one of the ways that appeared to be a custom that the people, the people would do back then, and God codified it in Deuteronomy to say, I want you to take care of the widow. However, it was not mandatory. There's something else we need to recognize. It was not mandatory. If a man did not desire to marry his brother's wife, he could say no. The penalty for saying no is that the wife of the deceased brother would take off his sandal and spit in his face in front of the elders of the city. So a little embarrassing, but not that big of a penalty. We could say no. We don't, this isn't mandatory. We don't have to do this. And, and it seems like the wife would want it also would be a prerequisite the wife wants to marry the brother as well. But nevertheless, it wasn't mandatory. But this custom seems to have left behind in a new covenant. Well, how do we know that? Well, Paul in 1 Corinthians 7.39 says that when he says that when a woman husband dies, she can marry whoever she wishes. But he only gives one condition. He has to be a Christian. So if your husband dies and you're a Christian... There's, you don't have to marry his brother. That's not a new co- We seem to have left this behind in the new covenant. The only option is, the only stipulation that Paul gives is that he has to be a Christian, which would make sense. Onan, however, in the old covenant, instead of refusing, does something else. This is also another reason why this isn't everybody's favorite Bible story. <laughs> but nevertheless, let's jump into verse 9. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. So theologians refer to this, I think aptly named, as the coitus interruptus. Putting it in layman's terms, he refused to plant the seed. Why would he do that? Well, there's a couple possible reasons. He probably feared that the son born to Tamar would be privileged over all the other sons born to him, reducing the importance of his own family line and reducing his share of Judah's inheritance. With his older brother Ur out of the way and no descendants, Onan stood to profit from this by being the next in line to not only lead the family, but receive a double portion when Judah passed away. You see that? So we don't know for sure, but these motivations quite possibly were what was motivating him at the time. But here's the thing. What, verse 10, what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death. Judah's sons are dropping like flies right now. Two sons have died, and no doubt Judah is concerned for his family line. So not only are his sons dying, he's like, my family line's broken. They're dying. There's no descendants. He only has one son left, Sheila. One son left. And you know what? When I was studying this week, I couldn't help but think, perhaps Judah now could understand the pain that he put his own father through. Just a couple verses ago, he helped lie to his father, saying that his favorite son was dead and demolished by a wild beast. Is it possible he's thinking about this right now? I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have put my father through that. And now I know what it feels like to lose a son. Nevertheless, verse 11, Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Sheila, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brother. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. So what, what is Judah doing? Well, first of all, we see that he blames Tamar for his son's death. He doesn't at all consider that it could be the fact that they were punished by God for their own sinfulness and wickedness. No, it's got to be this woman's fault. 
After all, she married both of them, and they both died. So Judah sends her away. He sends her away and appears to have no intention of giving his son to Tamar. So once again, we see that Judah's being deceptive. Seems like he hasn't really learned that much. And think about that. Who else? Who's going to marry this girl? Remember, it seemed that Tamar wanted, like, remember, having children was such a great blessing and was such a great mark of honor in the ancient world for a woman. She's probably thinking, two men that I've married have died, and I'm sure that no one's going to want to marry me. At the very least, Judah, it seems her hope was, oh, well, he still cares about me. He's going to give his last son to me, and I can have babies. I can make him descendants, and they'll care for me. But it doesn't seem like that's Judah's real plan. Why does this matter? Well, I have a cross-reference for you. Exodus 22, verse 22 through 23. How does God feel about the widow? This is a command from the Lord. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. Our God is close to the brokenhearted. You know, it's really easy to read through this and to focus on Judah and how he felt about his sons dying. But what about Tamar? Two husbands, both dead. One was not even willing to perform his husbandly duties in order to give her offspring. Perhaps she's feeling alone and rejected. And not only that, The master of the house said, go back to your father's house. You can come back when my my youngest son is older. God cares about her. God cares about her. We've looked at Judah's offspring. We've looked at the jeopardy of the offspring. Two sons dead. What's going to happen to the third son? But now we're going to look at the origin of one of Judah's offspring. And if things were awkward before, it's about to get a lot worse. It's about to get a whole lot worse. Starting in verse 12. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shula's daughter, died. Not only two sons dead, now his wife is dead. When Judah was comforted, when time had passed, when he had healed, when he had grieved, he went up to Tinma to his sheep shears, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Tinma to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garment and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance to Enam, which is on the road to Tinna. For she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. So what just happened? Judah is grieved over his wife's death, and now he's got to get to work. He's a shepherd. It's time for the sh- time of sheep shearing. And the time of sheep shearing was a time of festivity, time of festive time. It was like a party. And Tamar realizes something. Sheila's all grown up. And Judah hasn't fulfilled his word to me to give me his son. And so she comes up with an idea, a sinful idea, but an idea nonetheless. She's going to disguise herself and station herself at the entrance of a town. And what's about to happen is not only shameful, it's disgusting. Verse 15. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come unto me? Judah sees her, thinks she's a prostitute. He doesn't recognize her. And you know what he does? He offers a goat as payment. But there's a problem. He doesn't have a goat with him at the time. So Tamar asks for collateral. What will you give me until you send it, the text says. Well, uh, what, what pledge shall I give you? It's like he doesn't know what he's going to give her. She has an idea your signet, your cord, and your staff that is in your hand. And he gave them to her. Now, what, what's a signet? What are these strange things? 
I want collateral until you send the payment of that goat. A signet was like a seal. A seal was for signing contracts or legal documents. The signet hung by a cord, and the staff is self-explanatory because Judah was a shepherd. But the staff is a symbol of his shepherding authority. You know, what I find? it's interesting what the things we will give away for just a moment of sinful pleasure. That seal matters. It's a sign of his agreement to contracts. He gave it away. The staff that represents his authority over his flock gave it away. Are we really all that different? How many times have you given something valuable away just so you could engage in something you knew was wrong? Your dignity? Your virtue? Your purity? Verse 18, not only do they engage in the sinful act, but their sinful act is going to bear fruit. It says that she conceived, and then she arose and went away, taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. Now that the guise is over, now that the deception's over, she's going to pretend like it never happened. But the troubles don't end there. Judah eventually sends the goat as payment so that he can receive back his collateral. I want back my signet, my staff, my cord. I want it all back. But he discovers something. Not only is she not there, but the men of the place say, there's been no prostitute here. You got taken for a ride. There's no one here. So now what's Judah going to do? Verse 23, and Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own or we shall be laughed at. Judah's so concerned about his reputation. Maybe he should have been a little more concerned about how God felt about it. But, he didn't, but now, even now, he doesn't care what God feels about it. He's more concerned about his own name. He's already engaged in sinful fornication, in prostitution. But now he's concerned. Well, I don't want to make a too big of a deal of this. I mean, just let her, keep the, let her keep the signet. Let her keep my shepherd's staff. If I make too big a deal of this, people are going to start laughing at me. Like, not only did you engage in something sinful, <laughs> you lost your stuff. Once again, Judah hopes that the sin of his past won't come back to haunt him. But God is about to do a work of exposure. We talked about that last week, didn't we? God will see to it that it will, that it will happen, that you will be exposed, that Judah will be exposed either on this side or the other. And that's why it's so much better to repent. But there's a time jump in verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. So here we see that we assume that this person talking to him is probably a Canaanite. Even the Canaanites know that sex outside of marriage is sinful. And not only that, there's an unplanned pregnancy. And Judah is so angry. What's Judah's response? Bring her out and let her be burned. Wow. It's funny how people can become so angry at the very sin in others that they permit in themselves. Isn't that interesting? Tamar, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have had sex outside of marriage. I was saving my boy for you. Maybe. Not really. He's so angry, he's ready to put her to death. And not only think, wait, wait a second, isn't that the same sin you just did? Where's your righteous indignation when it's about you? But here's the thing, Judah unknowingly is putting his offspring in jeopardy. He doesn't know it, but he's about to. He's about to. And she was being brought out. She sent word to her father-in-law, and I love this moment. It's the Jerry Springer moment. <laughs> By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Man, I, I, I can't imagine 
So Tamar sends this messenger to say this. I, I can't imagine like the look on her face. She's like, yeah, you go over there and you say this. <laughs> and what I love too <laughs> is that the language is so similar to chapter 37. Remember, identify if this is your son's robe. Identify, Judah, whose cord, whose signet, and whose shepherd's staff this is. What goes around comes around. And you reap what you sow. So what's Judah going to do? A man who up to this point has been marked by deception, who's, who we see is willing to lie his way out of trouble, what is Judah going to do? Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Sheila, and he did not know her again. Judah not only realized what he's done, but he voluntarily confesses. Judah repents. Judah repents. Judah, the one who we have seen is quite deceptive, he's now telling the truth. And not only this, this moment, this small moment, marks a significant change for Judah for the rest of Genesis. God, it appears, uses this one event to turn Judah into a different man. Certainly not a perfect man, but a better one. He not only admits his guilt, but he intends to never do it again. And the text says he never did it again. He not only confessed, he forsook his sin. In other words, to bring you back to last week, he repented with the right heart. He repented with the right heart. And this will mark a significant change for him in his life. But that's not all. So we looked at Judah's descendants, we looked at the jeopardy of his offspring, and we looked at the origin of one of his offspring. But there's one last thing. The promise from offspring. The promise from offspring. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterwards, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. I know you're still thinking, why is this even here? But let's bask in this moment a little bit. Tamar, who had no children, despite having two husbands, now ironically has two children. It was a difficult pregnancy. Seemed like there was a battle going on in that womb for who was going to get there first. And Perez, you know what his name means? It means to breach, to burst forth. So he's aptly named. But this birth story, like why does it go into such detail of not only them being born, but how they were conceived? What happened in this chapter was not only comfortable, uh, uncomfortable, but it, it was shameful. It makes you wonder why the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to record it at all. It's reasonable to assume that he could have just said that Perez and Zerah were born and that's it. Did he really have to go into detail like this? I'm going to share a little something from my own life. I was born of a prostitute who was deep into drugs and living on the streets of Philadelphia. My origins don't really look that good. My sister the same. She couldn't take care of us, so 
She gave us two, Art and Gloria Watkins. I know them as mom and dad. But nevertheless, my origins really don't sound all that desirable. Perhaps your story is similar to mine. You maybe feel tempted to feel shame. Or maybe you've done something shameful like Judah and Tamar have in this passage. Maybe you've done something worse. So with all that in mind, my question is, is it even possible for God to redeem this part of my past or parts of your past? That may be a question you have sometimes. The thing you did that you really don't want anyone to know about. Maybe there's something in your family history you'd rather just not let anybody know. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. A couple weeks ago, we were in Ruth. And so on the screen, we're going to have Ruth chapter 4, verse 11 through 12. I could not believe this when I read it. Ruth chapter 4, verse 11 through 12. Ruth and Boaz are about to get married. And this is what is said. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house. That's referring to Ruth. To Boaz, may the woman who is coming into your house be like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrata and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Now, whoa. (laughs) This is a blessing from the elders and the people of a couple that's about to get married. Boaz is the descendant of Perez. And I, I gotta tell you, before you're about to get married, there's one account in my family history I really wouldn't want said or alluded to. This one. But it's a blessing. And they could have just said, be like the house of Perez, but, and, and left out like, well, we don't really need to know how Perez came about, you know? But it says, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So my question, how could this be a blessing? How is it possible? How and who took the shame away? God took the shame away. God took it away. The main point I want you to see this morning, this was a really difficult text this week to get through. But the more I studied and the more I saw and the more I saw this story's impact on history, I learned this. God can turn your most shameful moment into a monument of mercy. God can turn your most shameful moment into a monument of mercy. But maybe you're still not convinced. Maybe you're not convinced. Well, let's think of this chapter as a musical number, if you will. Particularly, how does this story advance the plot? You're probably thinking, Tyrus, it doesn't. This doesn't have anything to do with Joseph and his story at all. In fact, you should have just skipped this whole chapter. How does any of this advance the story? My response to that question is, with a question, is Joseph the main character of the Bible? Is Joseph the main character of the Bible? Genesis in particular has a huge emphasis on offspring. So so does the majority of the Bible, actually. That's why there are so many genealogies in the Bible. You know, those long lists of names that you skip over to get to the good stuff? I'm guilty of that sometimes too. But nevertheless, why are they there? Why does the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, place so much emphasis on offspring? Why would it do that? Well, I have another cross-reference for you. Genesis 3, 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is God speaking to the serpent. And between your offspring and her offspring. 
he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right there at the beginning is a promise of offspring. Remember, there is one through the seed of Abraham who will not only bless his family, but bless the whole world. He's the snake crusher. But the question is, whose line will the Messiah come from? Well, with the information that we have so far, if we were reading the Bible all the way up to Genesis 38, we might be led to think that it's Joseph. Isn't he the obvious pick? I mean, he's the righteous brother who we know will be exalted, and all his other brothers will bow down to him. Isn't he the obvious pick? And I keep on pointing out through this series that Joseph is a type and shadow of Christ, don't I? That's what all the great theologians of the past keep pointing out, that, he, that Joseph points to something more ultimate in Christ. Isn't Joseph the most obvious pick about who Jesus will descend from? But is it Joseph? Well, let's find out. Let's go from the first book of the Old Testament to the first book of the New Testament. And we're going to look at one of those genealogies that we really don't care to read that much. And we're going to learn why they're so important and why we need to read them. Go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. It'll be on the screen for you. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. This is how Matthew begins his gospel. This is the beginning of the New Testament. You know what it says? The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Now that's strange. Judah's not the firstborn son. Why is he listed there? Reuben's the firstborn son, but Judah is given preeminence. So the question before we read verse 3 is, which one is Jesus going to descend from? Verse 3, and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. Which son was it? And Perez, the father of Hezron. The story of Joseph is about how God uses the rejected godly brother to save and preserve the covenant family. But more specifically, to save and preserve the one from whom the promised seed will come. That's Judah. The story of Joseph isn't about Joseph. It's about someone far more significant. Because Joseph's not the main character of the Bible. Jesus is. But why would God not choose the most righteous line from which Christ would come? Well, first of all, he... (laughs) If that was the case, God wouldn't have any choices. (laughs) All of our family lines are marked by sin. And Joseph, for as good as he was, was still a sinner in the need of redemption. But here's what I want you to see. Matthew Henry says this, God will show that his choice is of grace and not of merit. And that Christ came into the world to save sinners, even the chief. Also that the worthiness of Christ is of himself and not from his ancestors. Amen, hallelujah to that. And what do we see in that? That God chose us not because we had merit or were worth saving. We weren't. He saved us because of his grace and mercy. Tamar is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. This woman who dressed up like a prostitute, Judah, who was deceptive and deceived and a fornicator, who slept with his daughter-in-law, he's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? Why? Only through grace and through mercy. John Calvin said this, let us remember that Christ derives no glory from his ancestors, but that his chief and most illustrious triumph was on the cross. Oh, that beautiful, wonderful cross. Jesus, the Lion of Judah. David's root, born of the Virgin Mary. 
fully God, fully man, walks this earth without sin. There's never one moment where he sinned. He was the perfect one. He was the blameless one. And on the cross... He bore the sins of his people. He bore the sins of Judah. He bore the sins of Tamar. He bore the sins of all of his people, past, present, and future. And on that cross, as he lies there humiliated, God used Christ's most shameful moment as a monument of mercy for us. And on that cross, he not only bore our sin, but he took the righteous wrath of Almighty God in our place. Using Christ's moment of shame as a monument of mercy. And he dies. But three days later, he rose again in victory. And that is our guarantee. That is the promise that the one who is the snake crutcher is not dead. He is very much alive. Forty days later, ascends into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's calling for all to repent and to believe upon him for redemption, for salvation, for forgiveness, so the guilt and the shame of our lives can be taken away. It can all be wiped away through repentance and faith in Christ and Christ alone. Because being connected to Christ is the only way your guilt and shame can be wiped away. And we don't have to be physically related to him to do that because we become a part of the family of God through that door of salvation. All the shame can be taken away. All of it, and not one spot or wrinkle. All of it. We serve a glorious Savior who comes from a broken, sinful people. He loved us so greatly. This application for this text, there's so many obvious applications, like chief among them, don't sleep with your daughter-in-law. Second, fornication and prostitution are sinful. They should be repented of. But though they are sinful and shameful, not beyond redemption. I don't know what you've done. But no matter how shameful it was, the blood of Jesus Christ, the one, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's more powerful than your worst sin. He's more powerful. Also, caring for widows is something God cares a great deal about. Children and families who have widows take care of them. Take care of them. While those are many obvious applications, uh, for whatever reason, I truly feel that this sermon should give a great deal of hope to those that carry guilt and shame of the past or perhaps something shameful regarding their origins. God is able to redeem our worst moments and work them together for good. What, what kind of... We read Genesis 38, we just want to skip over it because it's so embarrassing, because it's so uncomfortable, and yet God uses this account to bring about the birth of His Son. He works all things together for good even our worst sins. Now, disclaimer, just because God can redeem those moments of sinfulness does not mean we should seek to have them. May it not be. Rather, good come from our righteous deeds than our worst ones. But nevertheless, God can redeem them. If you're here or you're listening to the sound of my voice and you're an unbeliever, Judah's repentance was a turning point for him, and this morning it can be for you. Take full ownership of your sin. Repent. Confess and forsake your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe on him and him alone for your redemption, for your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. You can be saved. You can be forgiven. You can. I implore you to do it today. 
Because the punishment is that of an eternal fire in hell forever. But you can be saved. And it doesn't matter if your account of your life looks anything like this or it looks worse than this. It's not more powerful than the grace and mercy found in Jesus Christ. You know, this is July 4th weekend, and I'm, I've, I'm known for saying this. If you want to know the price that was paid so that you can have freedom in this country, just go to the veterans' hospitals or the veterans' cemeteries across the nation. Just go there and look. But if you want to know the price that was paid for the freedom for your soul, you need only look to the cross. Look to the cross, unbeliever. There's enough grace for you. But for believers, you're struggling with these things. You're struggling with that sin that you've asked God to forgive you for years ago. And yet, the memory still brings shame. I want you to see that the sovereign and providential God was able to redeem even this situation. Is He not able to do that in your life? He is, believer. You need to let it go. Forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward to what lies ahead. I'll end by saying this. The story of Perez's conception may not be a very flattering one, but God uses His birth to bring about the greatest good in the future. Christ, the promised seed, and the scarlet thread that binds us and never breaks. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, I, I thank You for Your Word. Lord, I thank You that all of it is useful. Lord, I thank You that we can even learn from the sinful things that Your saints have done in the past. Lord, we know that there's only one hero in the story, and that's You. Lord, I pray for the person this morning who's carrying guilt and shame. I pray that for your children, for those who have trusted and believe in you, who the enemy, who the devil says, God can't, God can't redeem. God can't use you because of this thing that you've done in the past. But Lord, we know you have the final word. Your cross had the final word. The resurrection has the final word. Your exaltation has the final word. You take away our guilt and shame. You throw it as far as east is from the west. Lord, be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to move into a time of communion. We focused a lot on the cross, and now we're going to focus on it some more. Before we do, though, God's Word says that we don't want to take of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So there's a few things that I would ask. If you're not a believer, I would ask you not to partake of this cup. For the Word of God says that you would drink judgment upon yourself. If you're here this morning and you are a believer and yet you are holding on to sin that has not been repented of, we're going to take the time right now to ask the Lord to forgive us of that. So, I ask that we just take the next couple moments as the music plays to come before the Lord. Now is the time.
Father, we thank you so much for your son. Thank you for his sacrifice. We pray that you be blessed and glorified as we continue our worship through the Lord's Supper. On the night which our Lord was to be betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread. And in the same way, he took the cup. He says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we who are not worthy partake of this meal have been given access to you through the blood of your Son. Lord, we thank you for all of your graces and all your mercies. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
we're going to move into a final song of worship all about magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ. I would ask you all to please stand. I pray that as we sing together, let this song be a reminder of the goodness of Christ and the redemption. Let's sing together. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i stand in christ alone who took on flesh fullness of god in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i stand amen before the benediction i just want to remind you that the cookout is proceeding right after we close here we'd like for everyone to join us for that but also if you're here this morning and you're a christian and you're carrying any guilt and any shame our elders would love to pray with you over by the cross. Don't leave this place without knowing of the healing power of the blood of Jesus Christ, of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Or if you're here and you're an unbeliever and you don't know of the redemption and eternal life that is in Jesus Christ, they would also love to talk with you. Now for the benediction. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit the God who is able to take away our guilt and shame. May that God go with you today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.